I can sell you the best deal in the world, but if you don't manage it properly, it can go south quickly. And management is not done by one individual. It's done by a team. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family to apartment rentals in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. Hello and welcome to episode 77. My guest today was recently named a 2016 CoStar Power Broker with over 47 transactions in commercial multifamily properties in 2016. Al Beecham is an associate broker with Income Property Organization and since joining IPO in 2007, Al has sold over 230 multifamily properties worth over a half billion dollars. Al, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Brian. Glad to be here. What else would you like to add to your introduction? I mean, do me a favor and just fill in the blanks. You know, I think the only thing to mention is that my company specializes in apartment brokerage and we are a team. And what's one of the strengths of my company is we really do work together as a team and we cover the Michigan and Ohio markets. So I think it would be worthwhile to mention that uh, Income Property Organization is a commercial real estate brokerage specializing in apartment sales and that we cover Michigan and Ohio. And, and what size apartments and, and multifamily do you usually uh, buy and sell? You know, our typical deals between 50 and 100 units, but we'll sell deals as small as 10 units uh, and I'm currently selling a 450 unit property. So there's a big, there's a big range but a lot of it's driven by um, the relationship with the client, um, the asset itself, the location of it. So we'll work on small deals and we'll certainly work on big ones. But our sweet spot's kind of the middle ground. That's where the bulk of our market share is. And, and the middle ground you would consider to be in the 100, 150 range? Yeah, I would say between 50 and 150 is the middle ground. In the apartment world, you get north of a lot of the bigger operators have a line in the sand of 100 units. They won't consider a deal unless it's at least 100 units. But generally speaking, you start getting north of 200. That's considered large deal territory, 200 and up. Small deal territory is below, certainly below 100, below 50 is a deal where you might not even need professional management. You could just even manage it with an on-site manager if you find a good one. That's arbitrary definitions. There's no black letter rule in that regard, but uh, industry norms seem to suggest that a minimum of 100 units for it to be considered a larger size. A lot of guys look at only, will we'll consider 100 small. So it just depends on the operator and what their appetite is. So a lot of our, our listeners are investors in single family properties. Um, but I've definitely heard from a lot of people in, in the past year that they want to get into apartments and multifamily. Can you kind of talk about the differences that, that you see between owning and, and uh, managing single families versus multifamily? Sure. A lot of my clientele at one point in time owned single family rentals. I myself did before I got into the apartment business. So I know the business and I've learned to understand a lot about it just from my clients who can, you know, give insight or comparative analysis to their previous life as a owner of a portfolio of single family homes. And one thing I like to say because of my 200 plus apartment sales, a, a good portion, I would say at least 10%, um, if not closer to 20, have been to first time apartment buyers. So I understand some of the concerns and questions they have when making that transition. And almost invariably, these are people who have um, single family holdings or experience, and they're looking to evolve, if you will. Um, and one thing I like to say is jokingly, but it's in all seriousness true is that when you buy an apartment, you get all your problems in one place. So with single families scattered, um, there's the you know headaches of being a landlord, of, of having to perform maintenance and maybe chasing tenants for rent or just dealing with the administrative issues of being a landlord. And the whole premise behind apartment industry is that 
you have economies of scale or efficiencies. When you have 50, 75, 100, 200 units in one location, it's a much more efficient operation. And anybody uh, with business sense understands that efficiency means higher profitability. What are some of those examples of the efficiencies you see uh, having all those units in the same location? Well, for example, let's say you have 10 single family homes and they're spread across a half an hour, 45 minute radius. Residential properties take a good beating. There's lots of wear and tear and uh, your maintenance personnel, or if it's you who's handling it yourself, you are going to spend all that time driving between those sites to change a P-trap or to patch a roof or to, you know, Uh, take care of one of any number of needs that might come up that the tenants ask you to take care of. If you're in an apartment complex that's 100 units, you have a full-time maintenance man, and he is on the job every single day, and he gets work orders. And instead of that person having to drive around and, quote, waste time in their vehicle between the 10 various single-family homes, they're right there on the job and it takes them a few minutes to walk over to the apartment that needs the work order. So in doing so, you're much more efficient, time is money, and you're not paying that maintenance man to spend um, you know, 20 minutes in his car three times a day, five times a day going between sites. So that's one example. But one of the more obvious ones And one of the more meaningful ones of why apartments are just flat out more efficient than single families. And a lot of my clients have commented that as during the recession, you could buy single family homes at very attractive pricing to where the margins were huge, meaning what your debt service would be if you bought it with a mortgage um, or if you bought it cash and what you could rent it for, your return on equity. Now that housing prices have rebounded so considerably those margins have shrunk if not disappeared completely whereas you can still make nice margins in the apartment business so uh, a lot of people are looking towards the apartments uh, as a place to put money to work where they can earn a a good leveraged yield you mentioned that about 20 percent of your buyers that that you work with are are first-time buyers of of multifamily and apartment Um, what, what advice do you have for first-time buyers who are who maybe own some single family want to get into the multi-family apartment uh, what do you typically like to see when they give you a call my advice is consistent regardless of who i speak with the advice is set your sights lower than you might want to so if i have a guy who calls me and says uh, i want to buy my first apartment and i want to buy a million dollar deal And I might say, well, you might want to start off with a half a million dollar deal. So I also, consistent with that theme, I would suggest whatever amount of capital you have, and typically with an apartment investment, you're going to have to put 25% down. That's kind of the benchmark. There are loans out there where you can put 20% down, but they're much harder to come by. And generally speaking, they're available to to well-capitalized operators, guys with excellent track records of uh, making payments on commercial real estate mortgages, uh, who have big portfolios, big players. So if you're putting down 25% and you factor that in, if somebody has says to me, you know, I have quarter million bucks I'm looking to invest, I might say, you know what, target an investment where you're putting 150 or 200 down, because it's always wise to build in a rainy day fund uh, to the investment. So I always encourage clients to earmark a certain amount of their funds just to set aside uh, to possibly do some capital improvements that they don't foresee when they get into the deal because uh, stuff does happen. And also, I, I'm i always a big believer in buying assets that you can build value into, where you can strategically deploy capital by um, upgrading units to grow rents. So for example, if you put a new roof on your building, it's not going to increase your rental rates any. But if you can, and and let's say that roof costs you $50,000, but if you have that $50,000 and it's a 10 unit building that you buy, you can put $5,000 per unit into the units and put granite countertops and new cabinetry and nice flooring and fixtures. And you might be able to increase your rents $100, $150 a month. You're going to recover that money in two and a half, three years 
uh, an increased rental stream, and you've just added a lot of value to your asset in the process. So um, I always encourage clients that it's a better business model to set their sites lower, uh, retain some of the capital, and try to put it back into the deal versus trying to buy as big as they can. How do you vet potential buyers? Because you you work with sellers who who want to find the best possible buyer for their property. Um, what kind of vetting process do you go through to make sure that you're finding the best buyer? One of the fundamental jobs of a broker is to qualify the buyer, as we as it's called in the business. And qualifying the buyer entails a multitude of of tasks and inquiries. Um, Certainly, the threshold consideration is having capital on hand to do uh, what the buyer is seeking to do. So uh, the apartment business, even though seemingly is a, is a big universe, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of a small universe. And if you're in the business for long enough, you get to know a lot of the operators and owners. You know, there's roughly 15,000 apartment complexes in the state of Michigan, and a huge percentage of those are owned by probably – less than 500 people. There's a lot of familiar faces out there, but when you get into the smaller deals, a lot of times that can bring first-time buyers or buyers who don't own a lot of stuff that we don't know. And that's where my job for my client who's selling the building is to find out, you know, what is this person's qualifications? And a lot of times the seller will want to see proof of funds. Um, so they don't want to negotiate a deal with somebody. They don't want somebody touring their property because apartments are tenant sensitive. You'll never see an apartment building, or at least you shouldn't, with a for sale sign out front. Uh, you drive by commercial buildings and you see for sale signs because those properties aren't tenant sensitive. Uh, but departments are where people live, and pe- tenants freak out if they know the building's for sale. They're worried that the new landlord will be a jerk, that uh, their rent's going to get raised a lot. They just have generalized anxiety about a sale of their home. So that's for that reason, uh, any good apartment broker is never going to put a for sale sign out front and they're going to try to do it discreetly. So, and this also holds true, especially at smaller properties, the tenants become very adept at spotting people who don't belong. So as part of the qualification process, you don't want to take a buyer to tour a property or any of uh, their investors or personnel who might want to um, inspect the asset until you know that they're qualified because it can it can cause some heartache for the owner. Tenants start calling, are you selling the building? What's going on? So we try to determine upfront as much as possible that not only does this buyer have the capital to buy this deal, that they've done their homework, that they've performed some upfront due diligence to avoid causing an unnecessary, unnecessary disruption to the property and, and quite frankly, just wasting anybody's time, whether it's the, the buyer, the seller, or the broker. Uh, from there, another level of the qualification is seeing who their lending sources may be. Nine out of 10 apartment sales involve financing. and They're not all cash. Some lenders are much more active in the apartment world than others. Um, some banks are known to be just virtually a waste of time to go to for commercial real estate financing, even in 2017. Some just aren't competitive. And so these are the, the most important things is the, is the capital structure of the deal. The equity, where is it coming from? Do you have enough to do it? Your debt financing, where is that coming from? And also, what's your qualifications? Do you own any property? Uh, because really, at the end of the day, there's two fundamental elements to a buyer doing a deal, and it's it's money and intent. So you, a good broker makes sure that the dollars are there, that the intent is there. And the intent is often e- evidenced by experience and um, track record, you know, of actually buying stuff. Because there, there are a lot of tire kickers out there. And, and what can someone who may not have that experience, who, who uh, does not yet reach your qualifications or, or, your, or your vetting or your qualifying, what can they do to better their position in your eyes? A good thing for a buyer to do who might not – somebody who's interested in acquiring an apartment building who might not have any or limited uh, real estate holdings currently is to talk with lenders up front. See, in the, when it comes to a commercial real estate mortgage, there's no pre-approval. That's for homes. But it does make sense for somebody to go to an existing lending relationship or banking relationship they may have and say, listen, I'm thinking about buying an apartment building. Um, I want to start looking. And here's how much money I have to put down. You know, what kind of loan could would you stretch this to, and on what kind of terms? So, if they can get a comfort level on their financing um, up front, or talk to a few lenders which they may have experience with, or 
and this is where the broker comes in hand. A broker, if nothing else, should be a clearinghouse for resources for both buyer and seller. I am doing this every single day. I know what lenders are active. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Questions like, do you have any recommendations on which lenders I should go to? Who do you find is active? And that's a very specific question. It depends on <coughs> excuse me, the borrower and where they're looking to invest in and what size deal they're looking. So um, certain banks won't touch certain areas. Certain banks don't touch certain deal sizes. So lean on the broker for advice and help. It's free. So avail yourself. A lot of times people's egos get in the way and – I think one thing I've encountered is sometimes first-time buyers get in their own way because they're too proud to ask for advice, and, and, and they may have had a good track record with homes and buying homes and getting those deals done and getting the financing done. And But it, it's, really, it's, it's really a much different industry. Uh, it's regulated much different, top to bottom. It's very, very different. So – you know, don't be shy about asking the broker for their suggestions. And a good broker is going to want to steer the buyer towards success. A good broker is going to want to develop a, a lengthy, fruitful business relationship. Um, this isn't like selling a house where it could be a one-off and you never see that person again. Many of my clients, if not the majority, are uh, individuals that I have done repeat business with buying and selling we make money together we develop a business relationship and i'm in it for the long haul i'm 38 i'll be doing this god willing another you know 30 40 years and i want to i want to sell a deal to a guy i want to see him do well on it i want to help him along the way i want to see him sell or refinance that make a bunch of money onto it make, make a bunch of money on the deal move on to the next one so um, develop a relationship with a broker, develop a relationship with a lender, and uh, good things will happen. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single family to apartment rentals in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager, interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. You can't understate that point you just made about how commercial multifamily, commercial apartment investing is really a team activity. Um, people coming from the single family world may have been doing everything themselves. But once you move up to multifamily and apartments, you really need to bring some firepower with you uh, with, with a good team. 100%. Some of the bigger operators I deal with, they have a lot of employees and buying a deal right, meaning not overpaying, you know, you know, negotiating a good deal is a huge part of success. But what I like to tell a lot of my clients, especially guys who might just be getting into the business is I can sell you the best deal in the world, but if you don't manage it properly, it can go south quickly. And management is incredibly important. And management is not done by one individual. It's done by a team. So for example, let's use a 100, 100 unit property uh, as an example. The performance, I can sell you a 100 unit deal, deal that, that's a good buy that you're going to make a nice return on. And if you don't have a good on-site manager, a good on-site leasing agent, a good on-site uh, full-time maintenance tech, and depending on the age of the property and the market it's in, you might have one and a half maintenance men, meaning a full-timer and a part-timer. And depending on the turnover of the property, you might have a full-time property manager and a part-time leasing agent. These people will dictate as much as how attractively you negotiate the purchase, how profitable that investment is. You can have two properties right next to each other in the same market. I've seen it countless times in my career. One property is 100% occupied or very close to full, very uh, performing very well, handsome cash flow. The property next door might be 75, 80% and not doing very well. And in the apartment business, you make all your money, the bulk of your money. Because for a typical apartment investment, 50 
a, a typical income to expense ratio is 50 to 60%, meaning for every dollar you make in rent, 50 to 60 cents of it's going to go to pay your operating expenses. And operating expenses excludes debt service, i.e. mortgage payment. So for a typical deal, let's take every dollar you bring in. If 50 cents of that dollar go to pay your operating expenses, after your debt service, that might account for, depending on how highly levered you are and what kind of interest rate and what kind of amortization schedule, because that's a big variable. Some guys want to pay down debt quickly on a you know, 20-year AM or 15, and some guys want to you know, have the biggest yield they can and put it on a 30-year AM. But that's a, that's a personal decision. But you know, after, after you factor in debt service, for that dollar in rent, you could go down to you know, 65 to 75 or even 80 cents of that dollar is now gobbled up. So if you're, a lot of times you're making your money in the apartment business when you're north of 80% occupancy. That's where all your juice is in the deal. So it's imperative to stay full. So, and you can't be there for a 10 unit building, you can lease it yourself. You can do the work on it yourself. But once you start growing and you get into the 50, 75, 100, 200 unit property, you are you are literally, to some extent, at the mercy of your employees and, and, and the quality of the management they provide. So you're, you're spot on with your observation. So I want to I wanna change the conversation and talk a little bit more about you. You're a, a 2016 CoStar Power Broker. I know you're um, you know, well-regarded, and I, I've certainly seen your name on lots of, uh, lots of properties that are out there over the past years. What is your special X factor or special sauce that brought you to the point where, where you've been recognized by CoStar? I came into the business in 2007. I was a lawyer by training. I graduated from law school. I think that's really what has been, for me, my success, I think, in large part has been predicated upon that because in law school, I took every course in real estate I could I could get my hands on. I think compared to a lot of my peers, I just have a much better understanding of the complete landscape of an apartment transaction. There's a lot of legal nuances to a deal um, in all aspects, from title work to the financing, to syndicating a deal if you're putting investors together, to the management, you know, the actual leasing, the lease contracts, the service contracts. There's just layer upon layer upon layer of the law that runs through these deals. So, you know, I've always believed you can never be too much of an expert in what you do for a living, but I think I just had a tremendous you know, the, the, the Juris Doctor degree gave me a tremendous leg up on my peers and my competitors. And I, I think that's really what has enabled me and, you know, positioned me to do a lot of deals. And I think my clients see that I know what I'm talking about. And I think their attorneys quickly recognize that I know what I'm talking about. And I can have conversations with these attorneys. And when and, and notice I say when, not if, but when legal matters arise in a deal because there's always you know hiccups in a deal. Being in a position to go in and have an intelligent conversation with the lawyers, with seller's counsel, with purchaser's counsel, with counsel for the title company, that puts you in a tremendous uh, advantage as a broker to be able to resolve the situations. And over the years, there's been lots of issues that have popped up where I have been right in the mix with the attorneys helping figure it out. Can you give me an example of how your legal experience has, has helped keep a deal together? Sure. 2009, the world was a very dark place. During the recession, almost everything that was selling was bank owned. And I was able to make inroads with a lot of lenders to sell REO assets, bank owned or you know, in distress, you know, in default on the mortgage, whatever you may have. I was selling something for a local bank here in Metro Detroit. This was my first experience with realizing what a tremendous advantage the education provided me. But long story short, this was an apartment complex, which actually, ironically, a group of attorneys had bought and sought to convert to condos. Um, they were gonna. They put what's called a master deed on the property, which is the legal mechanism in Michigan for creating a condo and then the market fell out. So they had bought the property, the apartment complex in 2007 with intentions of condoing it and they did some upgrades to the units, but then 
the the bottom fell out of the market and um, they went into default because they paid top dollar for the property. They were having a hard time renting it. Uh, also, <laughs> this harkens back to what I touched on earlier, but they were not good operators uh, because they just didn't have a good management team. So the deal went sideways and I was hired by the bank to sell it. Well, in the process of selling it, um, the lender, the bank for the buyer uh, reviewed the title work. And in the title work, there was a what's called a CCR, which is uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions, which were placed on title. This apartment complex was located in a platted subdivision. And they came back and they said, we're not going to lend on the deal. And the reason we're not going to lend on the deal is because there is a prohibition in the CCRs from any multifamily properties being built. It says that in this platted sub that um, any property has to be single family residential. So the bank's concern is that if there was a fire or casualty event, they would not be able to rebuild and that their loan would be in severe uh, jeopardy and therefore they weren't comfortable making the loan. Well, the CCRs were probably about 60 pages of dense reading. And I took that home with me after I found out that this deal was going to blow up. And I took that home with me one night and I poured over it line by line. And I caught in the CCRs that there had actually been what they call a scrivener's error. Scrivener is a, is a legal term for somebody who's drafting something. And what, had, what happened was is there was all these lots in this platted subdivision. And they had erroneously transcribed um, some of the lots, which included the apartments. So there was a discrepancy, uh, which was due to an error. So the bottom line was the restriction that was placed upon the, uh, theoretically was placed upon the apartments, prohibiting them from existing, was not in fact true at all. And after pointing the Scrivener's error out, the title company acknowledged that it was a Scrivener's error. The bank acknowledged it was a Scrivener's error. The title company uh, insured over the existing issue and the attorney for the subdivision, because there was a, uh, a neighborhood association, agreed to post-closing draft a document which would correct that Scrivener's error. So had I not taken the time to read that 50-page recorded instrument, and understand exactly where the mistake was, there would have been no deal. It, it, that's a great example of how these things tend to just blow up for, for little reasons like that. Your, your legal experience definitely helped save that deal. And it also points out how important it is to have an attorney or a good team of attorneys on, on your side to, to catch these things as well. Yes, and if there wasn't seasoned real estate attorneys there to recognize the situation for what it was, they wouldn't have been able to get comfortable with it. So having a specialist in anything in life is important, whether it's your doctor, uh, your financial planner, your attorney, whatever it is, you know, and I, I like to see one thing that always makes me cringe is when I see an attorney for a buyer or seller come in who I can quickly recognize is not versed in commercial real estate or apartments. And that makes things go generally speaking, not as smoothly. That would be another piece of advice I would have for your listeners is that if you have an attorney who has done some some work for you in other areas, whether it be, you know, family law or estate planning, you know, be careful about hiring them for an apartment transaction. Ask 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 relevant questions like have you ever handled an apartment deal or how much of your workload is in commercial real estate because you do not want somebody practicing on your deal. And I've seen what happens when attorneys, um, because a lot of them will not acknowledge that they don't have the requisite expertise for the situation at hand. They just won't tell their clients that um, for both ego and just because they want to, you know, take the take the job and make the money. Um, so those are very relevant questions when your your listeners are are, are trying to find out who they want to hire. In my opinion, the sweet spot for attorneys is. Not the old guy in the firm because he's on vacation half the year and he's going to farm out the work to younger people. And you don't want the, the, the kid fresh out of law school either because they're going to be practicing on your deal. The sweet spot is, you know, the attorney who might be in his late 30s, 40s or 50s who's in the prime of his career, who's going to, you know, be on your be on your job, be working for you and knows what they're doing. 
Yeah, having the wrong attorney handle your, your commercial real estate matters can at a minimum just cost you a lot of extra money in mistakes and, and at, at the worst, sometimes kill the deal. I've seen both of those many, many times. And one good thing a broker can do, again, about being a free resource is ask the broker, do you have any attorneys you recommend? And I mean, I can give... You know, when I get asked that question, depending on what market I'm working in, I can give three, four, five referrals and say, you know, call these individuals who you're comfortable with and all of them know exactly what they're doing. These issues that like the Scrivener's error that you just brought up and, and the, the small legal matter, I tend to find that on, on a lot of deals, you see these happen quite often. And, and a good expert team can, can really kind of solve them pretty quickly. Do you find the same thing? Like every deal has some, some sort of uh, issue that needs to be solved like that? 100%. And one thing that we say in this office is if, if it's easy, it isn't real. And deals are tough. And it, it starts from the beginning and it goes all the way to the end. The negotiate If the negotiations are easy, the deal's probably not real. Somebody's heart isn't in it. Um, there's so many different things that can pop up, you know, whether it's uh, the, actually negotiating the deal, then negotiating the purchase agreement, which is a tug of war between two sides. And then the title work comes in and there's almost always some sort of surprise. I mean, not every time, but some sort of, you know, for example, a very common surprise in the title work is, oh, the seller forgot to discharge their mortgage, you know, so the buyer, there's a, still an old mortgage showing recorded on title. And sometimes you have to track down a bank, which might not longer be in existence and may have been gobbled up by another bank. So you got to jump through all sorts of hoops just to get a discharge of a mortgage, which was paid off. Or, you know, somebody passed away, you have to have a sign off of the interest of an heir. You know, there, there's, there's a, just a myriad of title issues that can come up. And then you have, well, what comes up during an inspection is the city flagged the property some, for some violations that haven't been corrected. You know, um, the lender can have issues with the financing. There can be an environmental concern. You know, um, the appraisal may have some inaccurate facets which have to be challenged. There's, it's, it's just, there's so many overlapping disciplines to the deal and having a good team surrounding you is uh, is key because even if you have a really seasoned good broker, uh, the broker can't do everything himself. I can't you know convince the title company um, as much as I might want to sometimes the title company ultimately their corporate counsel has to be convinced that the title issue is resolved. And similarly, the buyer's or seller's attorney have to be convinced that the purchase agreement is adequate. Uh, the banker has to be convinced and his committee, more importantly, that the deal makes sense and that the appraisal is uh, reliable. Let's switch gears here a little bit and, and just talk about the markets that, that you broker in. I know you're in Michigan and Ohio. What's your outlook on those markets? I mean, what do you see happening right now? Well, a lot of investors would not touch the Rust Belt, and in particular Michigan, with a 10-foot pole during the recession because of we had the highest. At one point, Michigan's unemployment rate was 14.6. I think it topped out at. It was a scary place to do business. 2009, 10, even into 11, it was it was ugly. A lot of opportunities were created for savvy investors, and fortunes were made. There was a lot of apartment investors who bought deals during that time period that they can sell for two and a half, three, even four times as much as they paid. Uh, back then. People who had the nerve and the capital to buy were rewarded. Um, but over the last, as the economy has improved and Michigan has uh, now down to 4.6 unemployment, I believe, maybe 4.2, somewhere in there. Cap rates, which is the primary key indicator or key metric for pricing an apartment building and you know determining the return, cap rates have plummeted in Michigan. Your average cap rate for an apartment in 2010 would have been a 10 cap, maybe even higher. Now your average cap rate in Michigan is probably closer to a seven. So 300 basis points decline. And in the apartment world or in commercial real estate, 300 basis points in cap rate is enormous. That's like a PE ratio on a stock tripling. At the end of the day, what's happened is, is a lot of apartment investors were focused on bigger markets and coastal markets. And as those cap rates have gone down to four and a half or 5%, which is like break even. You're not even making a return. 
they've come to the Midwest to put their money because they see the Midwest as a value. Not only they can buy a deal at a seven cap and eight cap and make a leveraged return of 11, 12, 13, 14 percent, depending on their their financing. Um, but they also see upside. They see rental rate growth. Rental rates were very stagnant in Michigan for a long time, but over the last three years, uh, apartment operators have been able to push rents pretty substantially. And you know, rents are forecasted at three percent growth uh, year over year uh, overall in Metro Detroit. Both international and out-of-state investors see Michigan as a place to come do business. So the, we have set records. My company and the apartment business has the last three years in a row. Sales are at a record volume. Uh, cap rates are at record lows. But but buyers are still making money because the apartment business is so healthy right now. Occupancies are at all-time highs. It's just a great time to be in the apartment business. Are you seeing a lot of out-of-state out or international buyers then coming into Michigan and Ohio? Absolutely. Between 2009 and 2012, I would say 80 plus percent, maybe closer to 90 of apartment sales in Michigan were locals. I would say since probably around 2014, certainly 15. And it's tough to quantify, but if I had to guess, I would say a third of apartment sales now are out of state or uh, international investors. And in some markets, maybe even closer to half or more. Uh, highly desirable markets like the Grand Rapids, MSA, Ann Arbor, those two markets come to mind, just have attracted capital, you know, big capital, you know, private equity capital from uh, the West Coast, from, from New York, um, from Israel, from China. Um, very attracted to those markets because of the demographics and the long-term economic outlook. And what do you see going forward, Al? I mean, right now it seems like there there's not that much product on the market. That which is listed tends to be listed either very high at a very high price, or it's there is no price in it. You're just you're seeing a, a bidding war going on. Um, do you see this continuing, or, or what do you think will happen in the next couple of years? We talk about that a lot in my shop, and I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. <laughs> um, I I think that. My best guess is, you're right, there's not a lot of product out there. It's tough to convince guys to sell because um, the part, just being an operator is so good right now. The NOIs, occupancies, net operating incomes, NOIs have never been higher. They're making good cash flow. And the other point, the biggest objection oftentimes is, what would I do with my money? If I can't sell and do a 1031 tax deferred exchange, meaning go buy a replacement property after I sell and not pay taxes, why would I sell? To which the answer sometimes is, well, depending on how much you paid for your property and how much you owe, you can make a big score. But you're right, there is not a lot of product out there. A lot, which is, is, is oftentimes overpriced or like you noted, uh, unpriced and they just want to test the market and see how much the market will bear for the asset. You might have a half-hearted seller sometimes with an unpriced apartment building. I think that eventually what's going to happen is as interest rates rise, and they will, and the Fed just moved them again two weeks ago, and uh, based on pretty much all the consensus of in the commercial real estate businesses, the Fed's going to continue to nudge that. Uh, the, the commercial real estate financing is largely tied to the 10-year treasury. So the rates that banks charge and agency lenders like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which are two major players in the apartment finance business, their rates are largely tied to the 10-year treasury. So as the Fed moves their rate and the rate of the 10-year goes up, the rate of commercial financing loans go up. So it's my belief, it's the belief of many in the business that prices will come down as rates go up because there is an undeniable, inevitable, inverse relationship between interest rates and cap rates. The more you spend for your loan, the higher your debt service, the lower you can afford to pay for the property. I do believe that conditions will come back down to earth a bit in the next two, call it three years as, as interest rates continue to go up. So people who, it's still a great time to buy though. It's not necessarily just purely a seller's market because you can book long-term debt, you can get a 10-year rate locked loan for four. I had a client yesterday who just told me he had a bank offer at 4%. That's fabulous. It's just, you know, the 30-year average on commercial real estate loans is 
So you're talking about literally half the 30-year average. Yes, while cap rates, if you're buying a deal right now, you're not going to steal it. Um, there's good deals to be had in any market, but I've personally invested in, in deals in the last few years. Um, and how I look at it is, is, you know, if you can rate lock on 10 years and hedge against the risk of interest rates rising and be insulated from that with a fixed rate for 10 years, um, if you get into a deal that's respectable, you're going to have all your principal back after 10 years because um, you're going to be making at least a 10% return on your money. So that's just a, a simple way to look at it. And uh, ultimately, all markets move in cycles. Um, just like this has gone up, it'll head back down. The only question is what's going to be the what's going to be the major tr triggering and I think the consensus is interest rates rising, unless there's some major geopolitical event which you know thrusts us into some sort of recession, you know, which hopefully doesn't happen, of course. Well, Al, as we wrap it up, uh, what advice do you have for our listeners? I mean, are there are there any resources out there that you would recommend for them to to get a hold of in order to learn more about investing in apartments? Yeah, there's a lot in this day and age of the internet. That's your first uh, avenue. Uh, there's a website called LoopNet, L-O-O-P-N-E-T, which you can get a subscription for to get premium access or for free. A lot of commercial real estate's available. It's essentially the MLS for commercial real estate. So that's a good way to educate yourself on what's on the market and uh, pr market pricing and such. Also, CoStar is another major industry digital resource. Uh, also, Post properties for sale has lots of analytics. It's like a morning CoStar is more equivalent to a Morningstar. Uh, what a Morningstar is for stock analysis, CoStar is for real estate analysis. More of an insider uh, analyst resource. LoopNet's more of an entry level, but both are good. We use them both here. Most uh, serious real estate professionals use mo use both. So those are good starting points. Um, looking at, if you're interested in apartments, looking at apartment brokers' websites, talking with brokers, getting to know them and developing a relationship. And there's a lot of books out there um, uh, which can be helpful to build a foundation of knowledge. But ultimately, if you want to really learn about anything in life, I'm a big believer. You just have to immerse yourself in it. So getting out there and, and being involved in it directly as much as possible is is going to provide the the most helpful, uh, the most meaningful source of information uh, to help you know your listeners make decisions as investors on if they want to enter the business and if so, which direction they want to go. So that uh, that would be my advice to people seeking to learn more. Yeah, and I think listening to podcasts like this one where you just shared a lot of great information for those who are looking to uh, to invest in apartments, really valuable material here. You know, before we go, if someone want, does want to get a hold of you or learn more about income property organization, uh, how should they do that? My office is number is 248-932-0300, extension 14. And you can look us up on the web. Uh, our website is www.incompo.com, I-N-C-O-M-E-P-O.com. And you can learn more about our company, see our available listings. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'd love to hear from them. Well, Al, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. I really appreciate you sharing all of your experience and, and great information. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. The pleasure is mine. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family to apartment rentals in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 